Well, it's Holy Week, and we find ourselves in the middle of Holy Week. For me, this is the most significant week in the life of every believer. The week begins with Jesus riding in to town to the shouts of Hosanna. He shares the Last Supper with his disciples. He's falsely accused. He's placed on trial for false charges. He's beaten and he's crucified. But the good news is, it's really only Friday and Sunday is coming. So I'm delighted that you've joined us today for this Holy Week lesson. Our lesson today comes from Psalm 116, verses 1 through 13, and verses 17 through 19. And they are a perfect fit as we prepare to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord this Easter Sunday. Today, we are reminded that God's victory over death fills us, his people, with praise. So let's prepare ourselves for worship on Sunday. Let's come expecting God to move in an amazing way. I would say, prepare yourself to worship the Lord. So if Jesus were to sing a song on that first Easter morning, it's been suggested that it would likely be Psalm 116, because it's a psalm. Uh, this psalm is a song of one who, has, who was rescued from the grave. The psalmist in this psalm tells of his encounter with death and how God saved him from it. So we can see why Jesus would sing Psalm 116. So the psalm itself begins with a personal testimony of his brush with death. We might call it a near-death experience. And the psalmist then testifies to how God rescued him from the grave. And in the end, um, he promises to live a life of gratitude. So I want you to hear the words of this psalm. Again, it's Psalm 116, verses 1 through um, 13 and 17 through 19. I, I love the Lord for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy because he has turned his ear to me. I will call on him as long as I live. The courts of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from the stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I, I trust in the Lord. I trusted in the Lord when I said, I am greatly afflicted. In my alarm, I said, everyone is a liar. So let's pause there for a moment. It's, it's in his time of affliction, probably in a in word spoken in haste. And we can think about this, that everyone's a liar in a couple of ways. One, that he was deceived by those he, whom he trusted, or that he just didn't seek human help because he was convinced that they were, weren't trustworthy. Probably the latter of those two options we think about, verse 11. And then he goes on to verse 12 and says, what shall I return to the Lord? for all his goodness to me. I will lift up the cup of my salvation and call on the name of the Lord. And then we go to verses 17 through 19. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in, in your midst, Jerusalem. So listen to verses 18 and 19 again. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people in the courts of the house of the Lord in your midst, Jerusalem. 
so the psalm actually begins with a declaration of the psalmist's love for God. And his love for God is a response to God's love for him. We might remember that 1 John 4, 19 declares it this way. We love because he first loved us. In a time of desperation, in a time of need, uh, the psalmist responds in love because God has shown mercy to him. He has heard his cry. So in, in his time of need, God responded, and so the psalmist responds in love. Verses 1 and 2 really speak to me. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy because he turned his ear to me. I will call on him as long as I live. So I'm reminded of the study we're in on Wednesday evenings in the book of Exodus, where the words of that, that passage of scripture, the book of Exodus, open in many ways with God hearing the cries of his people in their misery. And it says that he hears their cries, he sees their suffering, and he has concern for them. Sure seems to me that as you look throughout scripture, that's the character of God, of his compassion and his love for people, which we'll discover more about in just a moment. But the psalmist knows that in the midst of his hardship and his brush with death, his near-death experience, when death entangled him, when the grave overcame him, um, the Lord heard his cry. Verse 3 declares where he's at in the journey. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. This word grave, the psalmist speaks of Sheol or the place of death. And it is a place that causes great emotional pain. Um, it is um, a time of great distress and sorrow. It's the kind of thing that we hear Jonah declare is when he is thrown into the sea and the waters engulf him and seaweed in, in is wrapped around his head and he sinks into the ocean. And as his life is ebbing away, what does he do? He calls out to God like the writer of Psalm 116. The psalmist does the only thing he knows to do. He calls out on to the Lord. So down in the depths of his difficulty, in the moment of his anguish and distress, he also experiences the presence of the Lord. He called out, and the Lord listened. He spoke, and someone was there. God not only heard the psalmist cry for help, God turned his ear toward him. Now, I, I think about uh, when a child speaks, we can remain in a posture that's towering above them and engage them in a conversation, or we can get on our knee and so that we can look them eye to eye on a personal level. That's the image I have of God in this moment, that God turned his ear that God gives his full attention and he turns away from anything else that might have occupied his time to focus on the one who is speaking. Isn't that a powerful thought? That in your life and in your struggle, in your time of adversity, in the time of distress and sorrow, that he hears you and he turns his attention to you. The God of this universe, the creator of this world, is never too busy to hear our prayers. I'll be honest, sometimes I get so preoccupied with the things that are around me, I really have to work to pay attention, but not God. When we cry out for help, he's attentive and he listens. So it's this, it's this loving response where the Lord responds to his call that causes the psalmist to do the same thing. Well, the psalmist 
declares his love for God. It's down in the depths of life that he found that God was gracious, righteous, and compassionate. That is the character of who God is. The psalmist, in his experience of death or his brush with death, felt like he had been resurrected from the dead, that he had been given a new life. As we prepare to celebrate Easter Sunday, we know the reality is that Jesus actually died and he was, he was in a tomb for three days. But then God responded and raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death and doing the same for us. So not only does God declare victory over sin, but he declares victory over death. Oh, death, where is your sting? The psalmist can't help himself but respond to the goodness, to the mercy, the compassion, and the graciousness of God, knowing that he will do the right thing. So after deliverance, the psalmist knows what he must do. He must live a life that honors the Lord. He could not, could not continue living as if nothing had happened. He would um, be forever grateful. And that's good news for us today. That as we think about how God has worked in our life, we cannot continue as things used to be. Something has to change for us. There has to be a new work in our life. There is this commitment not to go on as things used to be. He would and we must be forever grateful. Last week, we noted in Psalm 113 that Psalm 113 through 118 were sung at the Passover festival, which celebrated Israel's deliverance from Egypt. And, and that's the most important event in the Old Testament because it reveals God's incredible power to save his people like no other. As Christians, the death and resurrection of Jesus overshadowed the Passover as the most significant event in human history. Again, it's this great truth that God not only delivers from slavery, but he delivers from death. Um, the Lord is the God of resurrection. And, and that really means that he gives us new life. As we think about this Passover event, it really wouldn't be a far stretch for us to see that the cup of salvation described in 116 is related to the cup of redemption found at the annual Passover meal in remembering that God had delivered them from Egypt. It's during the Passover celebration that the cups are filled four times and they're used at various stages of retelling the story of the Exodus. The third cup in the meal was the redemption, the cup of redemption. And, and Exodus 6, 6 says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. When Jesus shared the Passover meal with his disciples, the typical Passover cups were filled one by one. When the time came to fill the third cup, the cup of redemption, Jesus declared these words, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for you. So Jesus declared in the Passover celebration that this was an everlasting symbol of God's final salvation for all of humanity. So let me describe that a little better. Jesus took that traditional cup of the Passover celebration and transformed it into a declaration of a new covenant that he had given his life for our forgiveness and that he was alive so that we could have life and that he declared victory over death so that God's people could uh, worship and celebrate and praise him. We started out with this little declaration. It really was this great truth that 
the psalmist described the difficulty of which he found himself, of facing death head on, staring it head on. But in the midst of that, he cried out and God heard his cry. And then God, in responding to the cries of the psalmist, had demonstrated his great love for him. And in return then, the psalmist said, I must live for him, that I will not live as if nothing had happened. Hey, what about you in this season? Have you found yourself in a difficult moment of life with stress and maybe even sorrow to the point of being overcome that you might describe it like the psalmist with a brush with death? And you've cried out to the Lord. And we know that when we cry out, he hears us. I am confident. I know without a shadow of a doubt that he has heard you today. And why not respond as the psalmist did? That we would live a life that declares that we honor him with how we live. That we will be forever grateful. As you prepare to attend church this Sunday, this Easter Sunday, come with a heart filled with praise. Come with a heart that knows what God has done for you. Come prepared to celebrate and praise the Lord. Sunday is coming. Let's live like Sunday people.